Hello. Um, thank you all for coming. It's clearly standing room only, and clearly Bill Gates is a bigger draw than me, <laughs> as it should be. Uh, so I have the opportunity and honor to introduce Bill. Uh, of course, uh, he's best known for two things, as the co-founder, CEO, and chair of Microsoft for many, many years. And then starting with the Gates Foundation, but uh, then teaming with his wife, Melinda Gates, uh, uh, doing, focusing his attention, attention, most of his attention on the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So, he was born, Bill was born and raised in Seattle. And, uh, and he had a very supportive mom and dad. Uh, uh, so Bill Gates Sr. and his mother actually encouraged him. He started with computers at the age of 12 uh, in the local school, Lakeside School. And a year later, he started programming a computer with a, a childhood friend named Paul Allen. So then a couple years later than that, he goes to Harvard and becomes one of the very distinguished Harvard dropouts that they've had in their history. By the way, Robert Frost, who I mentioned in my talk last night, was a high school Harvard dropout. And uh, so he started Microsoft with Paul Allen at the age of 20. And in 94, uh, he started the William H. Gates Foundation. And so is it the junior, the senior? I don't know. I forgot to ask him. Probably the senior, but it doesn't matter. Uh, and three day, years later, the Gates Library. And, and in 2010, uh, it became the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And to date, uh, they spent over $53 billion. Uh, and I shouldn't say spent, I should say invested uh, that money. Uh, starting with global health, but, uh, and also strengthening public education uh, in the United States but since then branching out more broadly, now beginning to include energy and climate in terms of energy poverty, climate mitigation, adaptation, and gender inequality. So I just want to, on a more personal note, um, I've known Bill for a while. Uh, he was part of an American Energy Innovation Council, which had seven members, uh, Bill, Norm Augustine, other legendary people, and they wrote something in 2010 called a business plan for America's energy future. And they had about six recommendations. The most important recommendation was they wanted to increase RPE funding, which at that time was funded at $200 million, and said, no, 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 make it a billion. I fully agree with that recommendation. <laughs> and a 16 billion a year on clean energy. So, and in 2012, uh, he uh, agreed to come to an RPE summit, and I and he I interviewed him, so to speak, for about 45 minutes. Now, in 2015, he f founded with some of his like-minded uh, friends a new venture fund called Breakthrough Energy Ventures, uh, and it's to really get access uh, cheaper energy to really develop and deploy breakthrough energy technologies that. Re reduce greenhouse gases, but also uh, generating a financial return. And the earliest, many of the early employees were from the DOE, especially RPE. Um, dozens from RPE, which shows how good those employees at the De Department of Energy were and how good the taste of BEV was. <laughs> and so, um, and so, I, I just want to close by saying I've long admired Bill um, for a number of reasons, but mostly for his commitment to a changing the world for the better and for his really insatiable and wide-ranging intellect that I've gotten to know. So, um, so with that, uh, Peggy, do you come out? Bill comes out. Great. <laughs> See how unscripted I am. Anyway, so with that, uh, I give you Bill Gates. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's great to see the large group here uh, working on how science can improve the world. 
I wanted to talk a little bit at first uh, about a special topic, which is this uh, recent coronavirus, COVID-19 uh, epidemic. Um, you know, this is a huge challenge. We've always known uh, that the potential for either a, a naturally caused or intentionally caused pandemic is one of the few things that uh, could disrupt health systems, economies, and cause uh, more than uh, 10 million excess deaths. And there's a lot we don't know about uh, this current epidemic, uh, but there's a lot that we do know that uh, shows that this could be, uh, particularly if it spreads uh, to areas like Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, Southern Asia, it could be very, very dramatic. Uh, we're on the cusp in science of being able to make uh, good tools to do the diagnosis, uh, to provide vaccines, to provide uh, therapeutics, including antivirals. Uh, so our foundation is, is very engaged in terms of the relationships we have with governments in the private sector uh, to orchestrate and provide resources and hopefully contain this epidemic. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, for anyone who's concerned about that, I'm sure we'll uh, talk more about that in the Q&A, but it's a, uh, a potentially uh, very bad situation. Well, you're here in Seattle, uh, which is the city I grew up in, as you heard, uh, and just a few blocks from here uh, are the headquarters of the Gates Foundation uh, that goes back to the year 2000. In fact, uh, Melinda and I just earlier this week wrote our uh, annual letter uh, talking about the progress, and in this case, particularly talking about uh, the first 20 years. Right from the beginning, uh, we chose the focus uh, to be eliminating inequities, uh, particularly in health in developing countries. Uh, we thought uh, that we could make a huge difference, both in the R&D priorities and in the delivery systems uh, to make sure the latest medicines were getting out uh, to all uh, the children in the world. And this work has been very uh, gratifying. It's been very uh, successful. Uh, and in fact, today I want to talk about uh, some things that we're just on the verge of being able to do uh, that will help us uh, advance that mission very, very dramatically. Uh, the goal being uh, that uh, a child born anywhere uh, has a very low chance of uh, being malnourished or, or dying below the age of five, and that these big infectious diseases like HIV, TB, and malaria, uh, that we believe uh, those can largely, largely be eradicated. You know, over these uh, 20 years, uh, the child mortality uh, overall is down by a factor of two, and you can see that uh, in the chart that's in the middle of that slide. Uh, in uh, uh, 1990, it's over 12 million children are dying under the age of five, uh, and most recently, uh, it's about five million. We should be able to cut that in half again. Uh, that is, uh, with some of the science advances I'll talk about, uh, uh, we can, we, we're not done in terms of uh, the fastest reduction ever in those numbers. And if we go uh, two more factors of two, uh, then you, you basically achieved health equity. That is, you're down to about 1% of children dying uh, before the age of five everywhere in the world. In addition to those deaths, another tragedy that isn't talked about uh, to the same degree, but is if anything, uh, more impactful, and that is that uh, nearly a quarter of a billion of children are malnourished. And uh, what that means is that they never achieve full uh, physical or mental development. And both for them individually and for the countries they live in, uh, this is a, a huge problem and one that uh, has definitely been under uh, researched. So to get to this health equity, of course, uh, science is where we start. Uh, you know, we need governments to fund basic sciences. Uh, we need lots of partners uh, that 
nurture the ideas and are willing to take big risks, not only on specific tools, but on platforms uh, that would allow this work uh, to go faster uh, and uh, develop very, very low cost products. We also have to understand that the health systems in these countries have very limited capabilities. So anything we do that requires a doctor, uh, that's not going to scale uh, to reach the entire world. So you know, it's gotta be super low cost, easy to delivery, uh, very little uh, training involved. But it, it does represent an opportunity. Uh, these developing countries are uh, where uh, the population growth is taking place. It's where the economic growth is taking place. Uh, by 2050, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa will be uh, over 2 billion people. And that's more than twice the people in, in Europe and North America. And so uh, there's a lot of reasons to, to care about Africa. Today, the you know, most investments in health R&D are really focused uh, almost entirely on the rich countries, and in some cases, uh, because of pricing models, only on the United States. And this is causing the priorities uh, of what gets done and the uh, requirement that it be simple and low cost to be missed, and therefore we're not taking the best of science uh, and creating something that can have uh, its potential impact. And so a, you know, a redirection either of the market signals or the role of governments and philanthropy or scientists themselves against this broader goal uh, would help us make uh, far greater progress, even more than we have today. We have an opportunity with the advance of tools like artificial intelligence and gene-based editing technologies to build this new generation of health solutions uh, so that they are available uh, to everyone on the planet. And I'm very excited about this. Uh, the rate of progress will be faster. The number of people who care about this or are engaged in this, uh, partly because of the success of these last 20 years, uh, you know, I, I feel there's real momentum uh, and some of these challenges can be solved. I grew up, as was mentioned, uh, going to a private school here uh, called Lakeside, and that's where I first had the opportunity uh, to use a computer. At the time, it was a computer that was connected over a phone line, uh, very expensive, uh, a little bit confusing, uh, and so the teachers all kind of gave up, uh, and a few students persevered, uh, including myself and uh, Paul Allen, and so, you know, we sort of got addicted. We fell in love with this messing around with this computer, trying to get it to do things. Even in those days, the vision of what computing could do was very uh, expansive. In fact, down at Stanford Research Institute uh, in 1968, they actually built uh, Shaky the mobile robot. Uh, it was able to move around, you know, lift blocks, it had vision. Uh, it's kind of funny today that we're still on the verge of, you know, will there be this type of uh, self-propelling robot? Are there applications that it will be effective? And I was meeting with a number of startup companies this morning still trying to uh, crack that market. So it proves that although science goes very quickly, sometimes uh, the challenges we take on are very difficult. Uh, you know, the shaky could see those blocks, but of course that was a very self-contained, well-defined environment uh, that it was able to operate in. You know, a lot of this AI work uh, and the ultimate dream of software goes back all the way to 1950 uh, when Alan Turing uh, created the idea that uh, we should be able to match uh, human capabilities in, in many ways. And AI has gone through a number of boom and bust cycles since then. Uh, you'd have to say we're in a boom cycle right now, although there's some very profound things like being able to read and understand textual material like a human does that we actually have no idea uh, how to solve that problem. And it's sort of the next on the agenda um, and very hard to predict uh, when we'll get there. Even so, uh, the machine learning tools that we have today uh, are going to be applied in a broad range of domains, including modeling disease, 
uh, finding drugs for disease, understanding biological systems. Uh, and so it is a, a very exciting time. Uh, the capacity to execute those AI models uh, is, is doubling uh, more than once a year. So we're going up even faster than so-called Moore's Law by building uh, these very uh, uh, special purpose things to execute both the creation of deep learning models and the execution of those, those models. And so applying those in a broad way and really understanding where they're applicable, uh, that data revolution uh, is here today and it's suffusing itself uh, through many, many uh, problems, including uh, these health problems uh, that are, are so critical. We also have recent breakthroughs uh, like the gene editing technologies, including CRISPR. Uh, and so, you know, we should be able to use that uh, for very low cost point of care precision diagnostics. Uh, we should be able to use that uh, for therapeutics and we should gain understandings of how to do uh, vaccines, even vaccines that the turnaround time, instead of being the typical uh, three or four years, uh, literally at some point we'd be able to create uh, in months. And we wanna use these tools not just for orphan diseases or not just for diseases in rich countries, uh, but also for the diseases that predominantly aff afflict uh, people in the countries where most of humanity lives in the, the middle income and the, the low income countries. In terms of genetics, I'm sure we've all read the history, uh, you know, going back to when uh, you know, people didn't know, Pauling didn't know where is that information encoded, and you know, Crick, Watson, and Franklin laid the foundation for modern genetics by understanding uh, how uh, DNA encoded that information. And it's only 15 years ago uh, that the Human Genome Project uh, gave us uh, the basic blueprint uh, and let us now identify sequences uh, that are associated with different diseases. Uh, it was eight years ago that uh, CRISPR came along and uh, it continues to evolve in some pretty fantastic uh, ways, in including the accuracy of the editing. Uh, today, uh, over 89% of uh, genetic variants that we know are associated with human disease can be corrected. That is, if you get in to the cells of interest, uh, you can uh, make those corrections. Uh, last year, uh, human trials using these molecular scissors of CRISPR uh, uh, did start uh, to do things like uh, solve sickle cell disease. So we're really on the verge of a, a direct human benefit. So these are just two examples of, of powerful tools uh, that we can apply in a narrow sense or in a, a very broad sense uh, to improve the human condition. I wanna give some other examples uh, and talk about how you actually get from these great new tools all the way out uh, to things like reducing malaria deaths. Uh, one partnership that uh, we've initiated recently is one with the NIH uh, to, to go and develop very low cost gene editing tools with two particular goals in mind. One is sickle cell disease and the second uh, is an HIV cure. You know, we believe that uh, over the next decade, we will be able uh, to make this uh, breakthrough. And you know, it's, that's super critical because if you take the 38 million people worldwide living with HIV, 95% of them uh, live in, in low-income countries. And the current treatment regime, although it's brought deaths down uh, from the peak, the ongoing cost and difficulty of that uh, are very hard to sustain, uh, including uh, when you face drug resistance. And even so with that system, it's imperfect enough that we still have over a million people a year who die and uh, some negative effects even uh, when they're on ARVs. So, you know, the imperative to end that uh, and to have a cure uh, is very, very high. Sickle cell disease is an, another disease that's far, far more prevalent in low-income countries, particularly in Africa. Uh, 15 million babies will be born with sickle cell disease in the next 30 years. And 
the exact outcomes for those kids in terms of what their life expectancy actually isn't tracked very well because uh, the diagnostics just recently have gotten cheap enough and some of the therapies uh, that can help extend their life have gotten uh, good enough and enough progress has been made on the other diseases that this is now a big enough part of that uh, childhood death uh, rate, uh, particularly in places like Nigeria, that it is a priority and, and now the r and is being applied. But uh, today we believe that over 90% of the children born with sickle cell uh, do not survive until uh, their fifth birthday. We, these ongoing trials that are using the expensive approaches are very, very promising, uh, but you probably know those things today uh, because of the ex vivo approach they use. Uh, those are over a million dollars. Uh, and the uh, equipment and the doctors and things uh, that are involved in executing those procedures uh, definitely keep them out of the broad, uh, low-income country uh, usage. And so the goal here is to not have the typical multi-decade lag between when a breakthrough is available in, say, the United States and when it gets out uh, broadly to help anyone. Uh, the goal here is to shorten that, uh, if possible, uh, to well less uh, than a decade. The vision is to have uh, in vivo gene editing techniques that you just do a single injection using vectors that target and edit uh, these uh, blood-forming cells, which are down in the bone marrow, with very high efficiency and very few uh, off-target uh, edits. And that's the vision of how you could literally get out uh, and uh, save all of those lives and bring this incredible uh, disease burden to an end. Similarly, with HIV, the goal of the collaboration is to investigate in vivo gene editing uh, that could drive a functional cure uh, for all of those 38 million people who are infected. Again, it's a high bar in terms of how simple and uh, how low cost and how uh, rare the side effects would have to be. Um, but you know, we do believe that it's possible. Amazingly, gene editing is also uh, the most exciting tool for us for the work we do in malaria. Uh, malaria, uh, you probably know it's gone from a million deaths a year, uh, mostly young children in Africa now, down to about 400,000. Uh, but it's a very difficult disease to bring down from that level. Uh, there's outside biting, there's drug resistance. Uh, it's very, very difficult. Here, the idea is instead of uh, editing human genetics, it's to use CRISPR to create what are called gene drives. Uh, that is a uh, gene which is inherited uh, by all the offspring. If one of the two parents has this particular mechanism, then all of the offspring that has a parent uh, with this, it's driven uh, into the uh, progeny. And so we're working on genes that either uh, reduce uh, mosquito populations or eliminate the Anopheli mosquitoes, which are a very small portion of all mosquitoes, but those are the ones uh, that, that carry malaria. And if you could change their gut structure a little bit, uh, then the, uh, the parasite would not be able to burrow through their stomach back into their salivary gland, which is part of how that cycle of infection uh, is completed. Another area, and this is a very broad area, where we need much deeper understandings uh, is in newborn health. You know, here I've split all these deaths of children under five into two different categories. You have neonatal deaths uh, in orange there, and you have the postneonatal uh, that is after the first month of life on the right. And what you'll see is it's amazing that almost half the deaths are in those first 28 days. In fact, in a region where you don't have malaria, it, it is already over half of the deaths are in the first 28 days. And so the progress we've made, particularly against respiratory disease, diarrheal disease, and malaria, that has been in that one to 60 month category. So we're really you know, full speed ahead, with lots of new things on the way uh, for that blue area. But 
in that orange area, uh, you'd be stunned uh, how little we know. You know, most of those deaths uh, are done. There's no, there hasn't been in the past any type of autopsy. Uh, and so you just do what's called a verbal autopsy where you have various uh, symptoms. And so since we don't know the root cause, either of the prematurity that's responsible for some of that or low birth weight or those uh, early conditions, until we actually understand that, uh, coming up with the, the new interventions is going to be uh, very difficult. This is an area where you know, the sensors and tools have gotten so good that we can create, even for births in low-income countries, really large data sets. Data sets where we're doing ultrasound on the mother and taking blood samples during pregnancy, uh, things where we take biological samples of the baby uh, and really under, try to understand uh, what the pathogen there is. And as we gather that data, uh, which the ultrasound and other low cost wearable sensors are making very cheap, and we apply the AI uh, to identify those factors, even in some cases identify them in advance for particular pregnancy so that we can come up with the right intervention, uh, we think uh, we can have a big impact here. We are seeing more and more incredible links uh, between maternal undernutrition, uh, the maternal microbiome, and premature birth. And by looking at these abnormal states of the microbiome during pregnancy, we may be able to give uh, pregnant women micro microbial therapeutics as well as nutritional interventions that improve fetal growth and reduce the risk of stillbirth or preterm or low uh, birth weight uh, fairly dramatically. You know, another area that was not uh, a, a priority in science, but now with these new tools uh, and the right types of grants is coming in, and the improvement in the human condition that will come out of that is extremely uh, high. The microbiome is also uh, the key uh, to the optimism we have about reducing malnutrition. I mentioned uh, how widespread that is and how in terms of uh, even more than those deaths, uh, uh, making, uh, you know, reducing the quality of, of life, uh, this is a very dramatic thing. Even if all you care about is deaths, it turns out it's these malnourished kids that are so fragile that when they get diarrheal or malaria or pneumonia events, they are the ones who are likely to die. The kids who are on their growth path, whose weight uh, and nutritional status and therefore immune status is strong, are far less likely to die. So if you want to you know, deal with the, uh, those further reductions, a solution for malnutrition would help the survival rate dramatically, but even more importantly, it would improve the quality of life uh, for that individual where they would achieve uh, full mental and physical development. We are now starting to understand uh, these microbiomes, and we are seeing there are substantial difference that explain uh, the growth faltering. And so now uh, we have trials out to look at various interventions, some which appear that they might be uh, low cost. The understanding that the microbiome is not just relevant in these poor countries. In fact, you know, there's evidence in wealthy countries that uh, the super hygienic environments we have, an abundance of processed foods, antibiotics, they lead to a, a microbiome imbalance uh, that makes uh, kids in, in richer countries more susceptible to obesity, diabetes, allergies, and, and probably autoimmune diseases as well. And so, you know, I'm sure you see all these startup companies looking at microbiome interventions, even for diseases where you wouldn't naturally think, like neurological disease, where there is, in fact, uh, a correlation. Whether that people will map that into causation is, is yet to be proven, but this is a very exciting area. And this is an area that uh, needed these sequencing tools and uh, the high-scale data processing, including AI, to be able to find the patterns. There's just you know, too much going on there if you had to do it, say, with paper and pencil to understand the 100 trillion organisms uh, and the uh, large amount of genetic 
uh, material there. And so, you know, this is a fantastic application uh, uh, for the latest AI technology. Another new approach uh, that the foundation is uh, very enthused about is the organ on a chip. And in simple terms, the technology allows in vitro modeling of human organisms in a way that mimics uh, how they work in the human body. There's some degree of simplification. Uh, most of these systems are single organ systems. They don't recapitulate everything. But some of the key elements uh, we do see there, uh, and including some of the disease states. So, you know, for example, with the intestine, the liver, the kidney, uh, it lets us understand drug kinetics uh, and drug activity. Uh, we also uh, are culturing a human intestinal microbiome on a chip that will let us understand the interactions between microbiome, nutrients, and pathogens uh, in a uh, systematic way. Another area uh, uh, that uh, looks to have promise is the vaginal microbiome. Uh, it's pretty clear that a imbalance there dramatically increases the risk of HIV acquisition, and that because that's very prevalent in Africa, that's part of the explanation of why the disease uh, spreads uh, to in large numbers there uh, and less so in other locations. And so the question is, can you intervene uh, in a way that uh, changes that risk? Another organ on a chip that's very promising for us is the uh, lymphoid organoids uh, to understand vaccine responses. Uh, could let us develop vaccines are far faster and understand things like adjuvants uh, that are, are very critical for a lot of the new vaccines we're working on. Well, another uh, area that I wanted to mention uh, is uh, the connection between climate change uh, and health. Uh, you know, climate change rightly is getting a lot of focus, uh, but uh, the richness of how we go about minimizing the damage uh, and reducing those greenhouse gases, you know, certainly you, you wouldn't say uh, that we have a plan. The term for the reduction of the gases is mitigation, and the term for minimizing the negative effects is adaptation. Adaptation, that is helping people deal with climate change, uh, hasn't got nearly as much attention. And that's partly because uh, the vast portion of the suffering that will be caused is for uh, subsistence farmers near equatorial regions. And so you have this mismatch where the place where the money and science are and the place where the historical emissions are is almost entirely separate uh, from where uh, most of the, the suffering would, will be. As you get more extreme weather conditions, floods, droughts, uh, you get uh, more pests and disease. And it means the percentage of years where your crop almost entirely fails will go up very substantially. And of course, then that means those kids, the rates of malnutrition uh, can go up even higher. And as I mentioned, that very directly connects uh, to uh, the survival rates and uh, the ability of those people to achieve their potential, to be educated and uh, get that country out of a cycle of poverty uh, and move beyond it. And so in a lot of ways, because of these complex dynamics, the impacts of climate change for the poor countries really aren't being talked en enough about and elucidated uh, as much as they should. Now, there are potential uh, scientific innovations here. Um, you know, historically, the Green Revolution uh, was fantastic with the cereal crops in terms of avoiding widespread malnutrition that many uh, scientists predicted. The groups that do that research are called the CJIR, uh, and they're around, uh, not as well funded as they should be, uh, but it is possible using their technologies to deal with heat, deal with salinity, deal with drought, um, deal with flooding. Uh, there's some very good examples of that. For example, a rice called scuba rice uh, that can withstand flooding. It's almost magical because the previous rice varieties would die if, if there was uh, excess rain. We also have a team at the University of Cambridge uh, that's using uh, evolutionary genetics uh, to help maize and other cereal crops 
uh, deal with microorganisms in the soil uh, to capture nutrients and waters. And what that means is if you're a farmer without access uh, to extra inputs, including uh, fertilizer, these seeds will be extremely productive relative to the ones that you've had today. Uh, it's like a second generation of the Green Revolution, uh, but understanding the shortcomings of the first and dealing now uh, with the negative effects of climate change as we uh, have a chance to more than double uh, the productivity of those crops, which means that even if you're having some tough years, your ability to maintain a buffer stock uh, and not suffer from malnutrition would be uh, greatly improved. As I said, uh, our foundation has been 20 years uh, uh, at work, uh, and we still have you know, many, many uh, challenges. Uh, our focus here in the United States is the quality of the education system, both uh, K through 12 and, and post-secondary. Uh, and that's an area where uh, the importance is clear, and, and so we're very dedicated to that. But the rate of improvement, there's no equivalent to, say, cutting that uh, under five death rate. Uh, although uh, there is a lot of promise at small scale in terms of making education better. The thing that our education work and health work have in common is they're uh, focused on equity. A uh, healthier and more equal world, is, I think, is something that we should accelerate. Uh, disease is not only a, a symptom of inequality, but it's a huge cause. And likewise, low quality public education uh, uh, drives inequality. When we first started our foundation, we were very optimistic about the power of innovation. You know, I had the experience from Microsoft where uh, that all went well. And looking at the global health work, uh, that optimism really is, has been borne out. And if anything, I see that innovation accelerating. So I think this goal of giving every person uh, the opportunity to live a healthy, productive life is achievable uh, with great science. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I'm Peggy Hamburg, the chair of the board of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and I have the rare pleasure of uh, having a few moments to chat with Bill Gates after that remarkable speech. You know, really, you covered so much ground and addressed so many important issues and managed to, you know, synthesize cutting edge science with some of the biggest problems before us and some of the, the really most um, powerful and, and poignant issues in our world, you know, addressing poverty. Um, you may not know this, but you and I were in the same college class. The only difference is that I actually graduated. <laughs> <laughs> But listening to you, I would swear you've gone to medical school. I mean, it's, it's remarkable, um, the depth and breadth of your knowledge. Um, and, you know, you, you closed your remarks talking about the other part of your foundation, K through 12 education. AAAS has been dedicated for a long time to improving science education. I'm just curious if you have any reflections on how we actually can do better. You know, here we are, you know, as rich as we are and as accomplished as a nation, and yet I think we keep dropping uh, in terms of our standing amongst wealthy nations in terms of, of performance of our kids in, in science and math. But do you, do you have some reflections on? on well, certainly, uh, if you ever get discouraged about US education, you can go into some public schools and some charter schools. And when they have you know, a group of teachers and the right culture, often long school day, long school year, uh, a way of engaging the parents, a way of making the classes very interactive, you can see magical things. Uh, places like High Tech High down in San Diego or various KIPP charters. There's a summit school two miles from here that has you know, all 
uh, very low-income parents, but it's an amazing school. So every time you see that, uh, that microcosm, you think, wow, why can't we scale this up to the 50 million K through 12 students? And why, as you said, the US educational results are only a tiny bit improved over the last 20 years. The percentage of resources we put into it are increased quite a bit. The relative strength of other countries, uh, including most notably China, uh, you know, they're, they've soared way ahead of us. Even Vietnam now, which is a fairly poor country, uh, has these fantastic educational results. The, it isn't like a typical science, though. If you say, hey, here's two curriculums, say, you know, physics A and physics B, the ability to control for the way it's taught and which students are there and really say, is this one better? And then engage in constant improvement. Uh, that framework doesn't exist. And so even for the curriculum piece that is subject to this fixed cost of R&D and low cost of replication, kind of like software or medicine, where you'd think, uh, we'd be doing fantastic things. That has not yet taken place. And partly because people don't agree on the goals, partly because it's hard to do right. It's kind of like the steam engine before they could measure the output. Once they got the calorimeter to really say, okay, here's the output, then they did 100 little tweaks and over time doubled the, the capacity. And so I still feel uh, that if we create the right framework for continuous progress, in teacher training and in the curriculum and in the various online tools that can engage the child. It's not, you know, people thought, okay, we'll put stuff online, but online doesn't solve the problem that it's all about motivation. We've had, you know, if you want to learn physics, fine. Uh, Feynman wrote a book, sit down, read it. You know, if you're a highly motivated student, believe me, the bits are there. Uh, so motivation is the key thing, not how do you make it interesting? And you know, if somebody's confused or they don't have uh, confidence, how do you keep them engaged? And there is some great work about persistence and how you encourage persistence, but uh, you know, the progress there, contrary to what we assumed, uh, is quite, quite modest for the field as a whole, not just our, our foundation. Right. We have to figure out how every student can have the Rocky the Robot moment or whatever that sparked your, your interest in uh, computer science and all the rest. Let me also now go back, though, to um, another aspect of your, your presentation where you started coronavirus, because that is something that, that very much is on the minds of, of people today. And we had a good session this morning on coronavirus with Scott Dowell from your foundation. Um, presenting, um, and you've, you actually have, have written so thoughtfully on both natural and intentional biological threats and the catastrophic risk that they pose. But we see these continuous sort of cycles of crisis, concern, and then complacency. And I'm, I, you know, you've been in this business now a while watching various um, epidemics and epidemic threats, SARS, uh, Ebola, um, the 2009 H1N1, um, now coronavirus. And, you know, you and your foundation, you know, have stepped up to the plate also with the current investment you're making of $100 million, uh, to help um, uh, make sure that there's adequate preparedness and response capacity in some critical parts of the world and on some cr critical aspects of response. But, you know, how... how uh, is there anything that this current outbreak is making you rethink about how to do some of the um, R&D investment and the planning? How can we really start to, um, to think about creating a sustainable preparedness approach as opposed to these sort of one-off, uh, you know, we'll throw things at this problem and try to, you know, muddle through and then maybe some lessons learned. Each time we get a little better, I think, but you're sort of a systems kind of guy. You know, surely we can apply um, systems thinking and harness advances in science and technology 
and an understanding not just about what's needed from science, but also how to apply it. Well, certainly the, the good news is that just the plain old horizontal advance in uh, how we make these tools will help us. That is, molecular diagnostics, uh, you know, the, those machines are getting cheaper. We have a plan independent of epidemics uh, to get those machines to be fairly pervasive in developing countries. And those are such that even with a few weeks' time, when a new disease shows up, you can uh, uh, come up with the appropriate probes and data uh, and then be able to do large-scale testing. So within a decade, the capacity to create diagnostics capability, we will be better off because we need that for the, the normal case. It's not going to be financed by some pandemic fund. The ability to create vaccines, there's a variety of techniques, RNA, DNA, and other techniques that are coming along, uh, you know, people like CureVac and Moderna who are, you know, looking at the coronavirus and other of these types of pathogens. Those aren't the only companies. But, you know, so that should help. There's been a huge underinvestment in therapeutics, particularly antivirals. I think, uh, you know, once we get past this, uh, and hopefully that's not too long from now, I do think that's something China may step up and others will, will realize there's been an underinvestment there. If the same disease comes along many times, like Ebola, we're actually going to be pretty, do a decent job the next time Ebola comes along. Uh, you know, we have diagnostics, we have a therapeutic, we have a vaccine, and I was just seeing a presentation by uh, some modelers yesterday the understanding of how you engage a community, you know, in that case, being willing to go to the health facilities when you're sick and uh, being able to make sure that self-burial practices are followed. Unlike coronavirus, where you're infectious earlier in your disease, so you could be on a plane or bus or in a store and infect lots of people, Ebola, the good news about it is that you're not very infectious until you're incredibly sick. So it's mostly caretakers or people who touch your body at a funeral who get infected and then maybe take it to another location. So Ebola is, you know, the, the spread rates of these diseases and the nature of when they're infectious means that they are many orders of magnitude different. You know, Ebola is terrible, but it's not like a 1918 flu. Right. Uh, and, you know, in the paper I wrote for the New England Journal of Medicine or the TED Talk, I used flu because it was the most identifiable thing. Weirdly, this coronavirus has a lot of similarities uh, to a very bad flu. You know, so far, probably more like the 1957 in terms of the death rate and the spread rate. So way worse than a typical uh, seasonal flu. And of course, you have no immunity uh, to this of any kind. So, you know, will this get into Africa or not? And if so, will those health systems be overwhelmed? In the case of Ebola, it was... Uh, which, the, not the DRC outbreak, but the one before that in Western Africa, the, most of the deaths were caused, the excess deaths, because the health system was shut down and the health workers weren't there. So it was uh, delivery deaths, malaria deaths, uh, pneumonia deaths, even more. Ebola was directly about 10,000 out of 50,000 excess deaths in three countries with a total population of 30 million. And so it's not just that direct effect, it's also you know, the panic, the overload, uh, things that infect health workers reduce your already very limited capacity. And so this disease, if it's in Africa, is, is more dramatic than if it's in uh, China. And I'm not trying to minimize uh, right. what's going on in China in, in any way. Yeah. Well. I certainly think that we know how quickly healthcare systems, even in this country, can get overwhelmed in a bad flu season, et cetera. So it's, it's easy to imagine the situation you talk about in Africa. You know, I was so struck in your presentation about the commitment to really um, uh, provide access to, to important innovations where they're needed and talking about uh, treatments for sickle cell and, and HIV, uh, where right now we're anticipating as we look at gene editing and, and sickle cell treatments that they're going to be 
very, very costly drugs. People are worrying about how we're going to pay for them in this country. And you know, you are an optimist in terms of the ability to actually go between uh, your current solution and your future solution on, on this, this slide. Um, you know, again, I love your optimism. Um, how, how doable do you really think that, that is near term, long term? And is it going to be um, sort of rethinking the paradigm, better application of science and technology, some combination of both? And of course, um, will there be this, uh, you know, su sort of sustained uh, investment and attention to the problem to really realize the goal? Yeah, the, the disparity is that for many things, the capitalistic profit incentive and the actual human need for some innovation, those are very closely aligned. In the case of diseases in poor country, take you know, malaria as an extreme example, the people who's, the families who have children dying of malaria essentially have no voice in the marketplace because they have no money uh, and their government uh, doesn't have either the research capacity or the money to cause those things to be done. So we do see this mismatch. Now historically, if you had diseases in the rich world that also existed in the developing world, if you waited like 20 to 30 years, often the, as the patents came off and the manufacturing techniques improved, the marginal cost, say of the measles vaccine, got to the point where it's available to everyone. And that really improved life everywhere. I mean, uh, it, you know, measles was, was killing over a million kids a year, and uh, now that's down a lot, not to zero, because it's, that's a very <laughs> infectious disease and uh, lack of belief in vaccines. That's a whole other question. Almost, uh, we'll have to deal with that before we can even talk about an eradication there. So in these things, you often get stuck in a high cost paradigm. Uh, you know, in another field, uh, you know, the way we do toilets has to do with putting water in and then taking dirty water out and putting it in a processing facility. That works for rich countries, it'll never work for poor countries. So if the solution that the rich countries who do most of the R&D take on doesn't scale down, then there's this awful thing that, uh, the innovation might never happen. And that's where government dollars, philanthropic dollars, hopefully can come in and see that's necessary. We also, you know, at some point, people are going to say that the medical costs in the US are taking away so much of society's resources that government's ability to do other things like education and social services and infrastructure, you know, that we really do need to stop the uh, medical cost going up as a percentage of GDP. And so, you know, if these techniques that work for the developing countries also, you know, with the right incentives, uh, should be encouraged uh, for all of the rich countries, particularly the US who's, who's kind of an outlier there. And, you know, so making sure that the barriers uh, for doing these trials and that, you know, the risk money will be there uh, there still is a societal need that the current structure, you know, doesn't uh, really draw out. But I do see an alignment um, as, as people get more serious about U.S. healthcare costs. You know, we went to the U.K. and proved out that the pneumococcus vaccine, you could do a reduced schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, now, we were telling the developing countries they could do a reduced schedule, but they don't like to be told that, oh, because you're so poor, you should do it some inferior way. So we had to get a rich country uh, to go to what's called the one plus one schedule right. for that vaccine uh, in order to say, yes, th this is the gold standard. It's good enough for UK children, and therefore you should entertain the idea that you, with very limited resources, who it, by eliminating one of these doses, you can probably introduce a, no, a whole additional vaccine and save you know, literally hundreds of thousands of lives. So it's very complicated because the rich world, which is the gold standard, the FDA, the trade-offs involved are different in a rich country than they are uh, in a developing country. And trying to make all of that fit together uh, is sometimes very, very tricky. Yeah. 
Well, I see we're already running out of time, but um, you mentioned briefly in passing the uh, vaccine hesitancy issues and how that's you know, beginning to affect our opportunity to, to make a difference eliminating or eradicating a, a disease that we have a safe, effective, and even cheap vaccine for. You know, this concern about misinformation that's out there about uh, issues, the anti-vax movement, the anti-GMO, I'm sure as you've done your work on gene drive and, and mosquitoes and malaria, you're getting pushed back. Um, you know, how do, how do we address some of these current trends where we're awash in information, some of which is good, some of which is bad. People are using social media to push agendas. And there, there seems to be in our country and in other countries of the world a growing sort of um, uh, skepticism about the, the value of experts and expertise. Um, just your perspective on that would be wonderful. To hear. Yeah, so there's two different trends that are both concerning. One is that titillating false information is more engaging than true information. You know, just saying, hey, the MMR vaccine has been proven not to increase rates of autism, you know, people don't click on that like mad. But the idea that, you know, they're out to get you, it's mercury, it's terrible, uh, you know, hear this sad story, that's easier to click on. And so there's that, and then there's this general notion of, hey, if the experts say something, uh, are they somehow biased or naive? You know, GMOs came out at a time when uh, Chernobyl had just happened, mad, key, mad cow disease was, you know, looking like it, it could be large numbers, and the benefits at that time were very modest. Uh, and the amount of explanation of what was really going on and the safeguards there and how other ways of making seeds with radiation are even worse, uh, you know, that argument didn't succeed. And you know, we don't care about Europe uh, for that. And until we want to do measles eradication, you know, we're not as involved in the ritual vaccination thing. But we get the same type of scares and misinformation uh, in countries where if you drop the vaccination rates, you immediately get uh, tens of thousands of deaths. Not like the U.S. where these diseases aren't prevalent enough, so it's fairly unusual. It's like, you know, New York City had a measles outbreak, uh, but it didn't spread too far, and the kids in general were well-nourished enough that the number of deaths uh, was, uh, I think, actually zero uh, in that case. Mm -hmm. There were mm -hmm. cases in Europe, both in pertussis and measles, where there actually were deaths. So, you know, is it the case that you have to have deaths before people pay attention to something uh, and go, wow, okay, this is a, yeah. a, a huge mistake that's being made here. In the case of GMOs, the mistake is that those seeds, Europe, okay, they can over, you know, pay whatever they want for their food, use any approach they want. But for Africa, it will make the difference in terms of the nourishment and dealing with climate change. And so to impose those views on them uh, would block uh, and even the, the malaria gene drive thing, fortunately, there was a conference and the Africans came and spoke up and said, look, don't rule this tool out mm -hmm. because this is a, malaria is a serious thing and if you want to come see it, uh, please uh, come, come to Africa. So it's, this is a fight. Is there, will we go through a cycle where it's not as acute as it is today? I don't know. Right at the moment, it doesn't feel that way. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm glad you're working on these issues and, a, and an important voice on the topic. I, I know that we're, it's almost time to end. I wanna shift gears a bit. You know, I've admired you for a long time for many reasons and your, your vision and your leadership. There's one area that maybe some of you don't know about, but he is a, a voracious reader. Uh, and every year he publishes a list of his favorite books, and I always consult that in order to decide what to give my husband for Christmas, and it's, it's always a big success. And uh, you and him, he actually share uh, enthusiasm for one particular author, Steven Pinker, and I, I'm told it's true that, that his book, Enlightenment Now, is one of your all-time favorites. And I thought, you know, maybe we could uh, 
end on a, a very positive note, if you could tell us why you like that book so much. Well, there are a few people like Steven Pinker and Hans Rolzing and uh, a few others who, who step back and say, look, despite all the things we worry about in terms of politics and acceptance of science, uh, and the difficult challenges faced by climate change or controlling the use of very, various weapon systems, you know, now we're gonna have hypersonic missiles, despite that there's plenty to worry about and we should worry about those things, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the progress has been absolutely phenomenal. And many people are literally ahistorical to think that in in a meaningful sense, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, life was better. Uh, and that's just not the case. Yes, there are, uh, there are huge uh, problems, but you know, if you're a woman, if you were gay, if you were subject to certain diseases, if you lived in developing countries, 40 years ago was dramatically worse than it is today. And so if we're gonna solve our current problems, having a perspective that yes, we have solved some problems, we're not, and you know, completely changing how we run government, uh, you would feel differently about that if you thought, if you really examined your progress and said however imperfect it is, the system largely worked to make that progress. If you think, no, we're just worse off, so let's just roll the dice and try some you know, utterly untried uh, approach, uh, to governance or you know, block, block new science because you know, some people even think that it's net hasn't been a good thing, that's, you're really losing perspective. And so the good news is if you read these books, they're both very factual, very readable, very educational, uh, and they remind you that great things have happened, that people like Norman Borlaug uh, with the Green Revolution or Maurice Lellman with vaccines. There's you know, some incredible heroes, and we should look back and uh, you know, regain our optimism uh, despite the fact that particular problems look very, very daunting. All right. Well, let me end by thanking you for the great things that you have made happen. And I know on behalf of AAAS and everybody here in this crowded auditorium that it's been a, a wonderful uh, afternoon session with you, um, and thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Please join me. Great, thank you. Super. All right, thank you.